If you were an AV or electronics nerd the latter part of the 20th century, the name Archer may ring a bell. Archer was a brand name that Radio Shack, yeah that Radio Shack, used to sell a variety of various electronic DIY and home AV devices and equipment. In this video I'm going to give you a retrospective review of this 1991 model Archer video processor. <laughs> okay, quick history lesson. Radio Shack's brand of video processors can be traced all the way back to 1984. And at that time, you can get the Archer Video Enhancer slash Stabilizer or the Archer Video Color Processor. The boxes claim to improve picture quality by reducing noise and eliminating what Radio Shack called roll and jitter. Each unit went for $99.95. As time went on, Radio Shack appeared to have stopped developing the color processing boxes in favor of one box that handled basic enhancements and effects. These Archer Video Processors had a chrome look that would go through slight alterations throughout the years. It wasn't until the early 90s that the Archer line of video processors received a total new redesign. The 90s models would feature a new black style and finish. My guess is this had to do with wanting to blend in with other video electronics that were moving to a black finish, such as VCRs. Also by this time, Radio Shack had combined the two original video enhancer and color processor products into one with the Archer 4-in-1 Super Video Processor at a retail price of $129.95 which is the product I'll be showing you in this video. Towards the mid to late 90s, the Archer name would be dropped and rebranded with Radio Shack's name. Along with the price and features dropped, it was the writing on the wall that foretold Radio Shack's brand of video processors were heading out the door, being replaced with new devices that try to be sold as professional grade, Hollywood style products in your own home. Okay, history lesson out of the way. Let's see some glamour shots of the Archer 4-in-1 Super Video Processor and see what bells and whistles we had to work with. The box itself measures 11 and a half inches wide by six and a quarter inches long by two and a half inches tall. And weighs, we'll just say three to five pounds. The Archer Super Video Processor features six different video parameters that can be controlled via the notch-free knobs for precise control. These parameters include Comparator, Enhance, Bright, Color, VNR, and fade. As for audio, the only real thing you can do is switch the stereo synthesizer switch in or out, which best I can judge goes from mono to stereo. I'll give a demonstration as to what these parameters do in a little bit. Let's take a quick look at the back. Here you'll see we have two pairs of RCA inputs and outputs that allow for two VCRs to be connected at the same time. Although the device is labeled with VCRs in mind, with many video playback devices using the composite standard, really sky's the limit as to what all you can hook up to this device. But I do wish an option for S-Video was added though. While not as widely implemented as composite at the time, S-Video would have allowed for a cleaner video signal to work with. To help demonstrate the Archer Super Video Processor's functions, I've got it along with my mini DV camcorder connected to this CRT TV. Now you're probably asking yourself, why not just connect the video processor to a capture card and capture the footage that way, instead of filming a CRT TV? Well the reason why I chose this route was due to the fact that this device doesn't work too well with modern displays. As you can see in the screen capture I took on my computer, notice how the picture doesn't appear to stay stable? My guess is that this has to do with the interference of the signal in real time on a progressive display. You see these video processors back in the day were designed with interlaced CRT televisions in mind, not for modern day flat screens that display progressive video. Now while modern flat screens can handle interlaced footage such as the broadcast content you watch on TV, they don't handle messing with the interlaced video signal in real time like a CRT can, which is what this video processor is basically doing. Okay, time out. Interlaced, progressive, what am I talking about? Okay, in a nutshell, interlaced is when an image of video is made up of two separate fields or lines of video that display at two different points in time. Progressive lays down each line of video one line at a time until the image is complete and repeats the sequence for each frame. CRTs were designed to handle video in an interlaced nature, while modern flat screens can handle both interlaced and regressive. But the interlaced footage is de-interlaced before it's displayed on your flat screen TV. Now let's see this baby in action. This is just some footage that I shot of the fall leaves on a tree in my backyard. So far what you're seeing is the raw, unprocessed footage. I've done nothing to alter the signal at all. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you the comparator knob, and what this knob does is give you a before and after look of the signal. The left side is what is being altered, while the right is the untouched signal. The middle bar is jumping around all over the place. My guess is this has something to do with the interlacing of the footage and the TV is trying to keep up with the signal input. Modern TVs most likely won't even try and keep a steady picture, but will instead throw up an error message. To make it easier to see, I'm going to bring down the brightness using the bright knob. As far as the bright knob goes, nothing fancy going on here. You can bring the brightness up or down depending on how the video needs to look. One interesting thing I want to point out is, if you crank the bright knob too high and your source is already a bright scene anyway, you'll see a red light start to glow on the box. 
I don't have a manual to confirm this, but my theory is, is that this is some form of protection method to warn about broadcast safe limits on luminance. You see, in the broadcast world, any content that goes to air must be broadcast safe. Basically, the levels of luminance and chrominance have to be in check and not be blown out of the designated level. Ignoring broadcast safe guidelines could result in the video signal being crushed and loss of detail could be an end result. Moving right along, I'll go ahead and play around with the color knob. As you can see when I start to crank the color knob around, the fall leaves start to go from an orange look to a bright red, which looking at it is jarring to say the least. Not something you want to watch on your TV. But if your content had a faded look to it, this might help bring some color and life back to the image. Likewise, if your color is too drastic and people are starting to look like they've been out in the desert sun for three days straight, you can turn it down to a more muted tone. The next parameter we'll look at is the enhance feature. As the enhance knob is turned towards max, you'll notice that the video is starting to get sharper. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in so hopefully you can see the difference a little better. Right now I'm just playing with the softness and sharpness by turning the knob from minimum to maximum. This is pretty much it for the enhance feature. VNR is another option available for manipulation. Now I'm not 100% sure, but I feel my hypothesis is correct when I say that the VNR acronym stands for Video Noise Reduction. However, when actually turning the knob back and forth, I feel like this is just another form of sharpening that produces similar effects to the enhanced feature that I just showed. If I had to guess, I'd say this was intended to fix video noise artifacts that can come with amateur video recorders, like home movies that were shot on whatever tape was lying around. But from what I can tell from this footage I shot, it looks like the enhanced and VNR parameters do basically the same thing. Now the last video feature I'm going to show you is kind of cool. It's the fade feature, and it does just what you'd think it would do. You can create a simple fade to black by simply flipping the fade switch to out, and to fade back into the video simply flip the switch back to in. The fade knob itself adjusts the speed at which the fade goes in and out. I have a feeling this feature would have gotten a lot of use for those trying to put together a compilation of segments from various tapes, or maybe splicing scenes together from a wedding that was shot. As simple as the effect is nowadays, you gotta admit, it was probably pretty cool to see on a home movie back in the day. Remember back when I showed you the back of the unit and how you can plug in two different units into the video processor? Well, here's where having two units could pay off. The switch on the far right of the unit, simply labeled Source, allows you to switch from one tape deck to another tape deck with just the flip of a switch. There's one more feature I want to mention, but I'll get to that in a minute. Now remember how I said that this device can handle more than just VCR footage? Well, I'll go ahead and show you a quick demo of the video processor running some Super Mario World that is being played through an actual Super Nintendo Entertainment System. As you can see, I can play with all the same parameters that I played with on the mini DV footage. Now that last feature I was going to tell you about was the stereo synthesizer switch. Now I don't consider myself a sound person, but from what I can tell, when the switch is left on in, you get mono audio, while switching to out gives you stereo audio. I'll let you have a listen here. In. Out. In. Out. I think it sounds better on out, but any audio gurus out there who play with this kind of equipment can tell me yay or nay on my mono stereo theory, please feel free to leave a comment below. In the end, the Archer Super Video Processor was a device that gave your average home user a small glimpse into the world of video manipulation. It provided functions similar to proc amps used by video professionals to alter video signals in real time. However, with a lack of professional features and broadcast quality inputs and outputs, the Archer Super Video Processor was a device destined to be used in homes, most likely to try and improve video playback quality of VHS rentals and old home movies. Let's face it, the Archer line of video processors weren't taking the world by storm in the late 80s and early 90s, but does that mean they serve no purpose? I don't think so. It's devices like these that get people interested in the concept. If someone's interest is piqued, they're going to want to dig further, explore more, maybe create hacks and mods that get to do what engineers never intended it to do. I hope you enjoyed this video. It may seem kind of pointless to do a review for a product that hasn't been on store shelves since the 90s, but I think it's a good idea to have a retrospective look at these old devices and see what contributions, big or small, that have been made as a result. If you enjoyed this video, I've got a few other videos you can check out as well. So if you feel like this channel might be your thing, feel free to subscribe. And if you have a response or a memory you want to share regarding the product I discussed in this video, feel free to leave a comment below. Until next time.